And now everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Natalie Asport. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Natalie Asport, and uh, this presentation is a continuation of a two-part series about AAA game art pipeline, specifically a behind-the-scenes look at the process of creating the art for two of the weapons from Just Cause 4. So um, today, uh, yesterday, we focused on the uh, cluster bomb from the Danger Rising DLC, from the Legacy Pack, but shipped with uh, the Danger Rising DLC. Today, we will be talking about uh, the Demon Crossbow from Los Demonios DLC, which was released in 2019. So we'll show the trailer. Uh, actually, before that, um, a little about me. I'm a vehicles and weapons artist at Avalanche. I have been responsible for creating art assets in the AAA video game development uh, for over six years at Avalanche Studios. I have learned a lot of the ins and outs of the production pipeline and structure uh, within the high-end video game development sector. I've gained a level of expertise throughout that time for making high-quality art consistently. And I am extremely passionate about what I do, and I really want to dive into as much as possible with you today about my experiences. So uh, I worked at Avalanche, and uh, it's, it's been great ever since. Um, since I've started working there, we've released uh, Just Cause 3, Just Cause 4, and Rage 2. I worked on the Rage 2 DLC in 2019. And today, we are talking about the Demon Crossbow. Uh, so I'm just going to start playing the trailer for it. And yeah, just in, sit back and enjoy. No one knows where it came from. No one knows why it's here. Awesome. So um, this was very different from anything we've ever done, as you can probably tell from this trailer and if you've played previous Just Cause games in the series. Um, so the next video I'll show is uh, more of a spotlight on the weapon itself, and then we'll dive, dive right in. Armed with his new demon crossbow, Rico sets out to wipe these demon parasites by any means necessary. Its primary fire shoots an elongating bolt that has the ability to pin enemies. And secondary fire changes its mode entirely, increasing damage outputs and physical impact drastically. All right. So uh, today's topics, we'll go over uh, the gray box model, metrics and scale, concept, references, uh, concept in, uh, concepting in ZBrush, sketches and exploration, creature mechanics, player interaction, rigging and animation, and packaging the concept. So this is going to be a little different um, if you have attended uh, yesterday's presentation um, in, with the cluster bomb. This is going to be a little different because it's a different asset. And as I mentioned before, um, it's there, every asset is very unique. Nonlinear workflow and nonlinear pipeline is video game development. So therefore, depending on the weapon or art asset, the stages in the process can switch up. So if you did look at the process um, in yesterday, these are going to be different. So 
so concept. Um, while I was working on Daredevils of Destruction at that time, I was approached by the producer on Los Demonios, Bron Re Rodriguez, who's also another fellow full sailor. He gave me the task of working about uh, one day a week to get a gray box for a crossbow in the game towards early development of the DLC. Uh, this weapon needed to be possibly the only weapon that can be used to defeat the enemy creatures in the DLC. And at this point in the development stage, there were no concepts, there were no previous crossbows or uh, crossbow similar weapons uh, to reuse to look at as a guide. So Just Cause series never tackled a crossbow that had made it through final release of, a game, of the game ever before. And this was a new challenge. So concept, but wait. No concept. Actually, we went straight to gray boxing something without one. So we went right into gray box modeling. Uh, here was the first iteration I did on the crossbow, just looking at old school crossbows around like, I think they were around uh, like 1700, 1800s, and mostly were European. This was a vanilla representation, if you're unaware of the term vanilla in video games, basically means the base representation. It's the base, basic version of whatever asset, or if it's a game like the vanilla game, it's the basic version of it without any modifications. So with this crossbow, it was the vanilla version. Um, with a little ornamentation on the top, um, but it was still a long way to go. What we knew, though, we didn't have a concept, so we did something just very basic. At least we wanted to hone down the metrics on the metrics and scale. And in this process, we need to establish the important measurements of the assets. Uh, with metrics, it is basically a, based on the meter of a unit of length, and it's relating to the metric system. We're ensuring that all major contact points are lined up with the player, and anything that is going to be interacted with is going to be accounted for ahead of time. So these specific measurements are the metrics of the weapon. And primarily, you are syncing with the animation team throughout this entire process. With this, I ended up bringing in the crossbow um, with a rifle. Even though this is not a rifle, we tried uh, reusing as much as we could. We took the rifle type that we had. And this was basically, I think, the same, around the same coordinates or same dimensions as I looked at with the cluster bomb. It's the basic weapon type. Might as well, even if it's a crossbow, it still has a trigger, it still has a handle, it still has a stock. So it is imperative that we lined up the handle, trigger, and grip metrics to line up with the animation team's poses. Um, this was a new weapon, again, but there is no room in the budget for new animations only if it's absolutely necessary. And the point is to try to get to that point where pushing for reusability only if it's absolutely necessary. And for animation, it's more work for them. The, t the work is more time consuming than the work for us on the art side in most cases. So um, there was a problem here with this design. Um, it wasn't a strong enough visual representation of what we wanted for the DLC, even at a gray box level. After all, this is a very out there DLC, uh, very unique, and it's with ancient demons that literally grab the head of their victim with their jaws, latch onto them, possess them, and control their minds and automotive skills, and gain their powers and abilities. Uh, so uh, this was actually a, a, an opportunity to do something different, do something unique, and possibly take a little, a little risk. So the principal designer gave me three, uh, a couple key words. Some were make the design ancient old world, which would align with the origin story. Try to incorporate parts of the demon, so as if it was made with parts of the demon, and make it ornamental. So there was no visual representation and no pre-existing weapon of its kind. I didn't know what my constraints were, and I didn't know what was possible 
and what, it, what was achievable. So the first problem was with this was that there, no, there was no concept. So it meant going straight to gray boxing. However, that led to more questions than answers. And I needed a concept. And possibly having an awesome design of a weapon that would be, a brilliant, be part of a brilliant DLC was hanging by a thread. So problem two, still had no room in production schedule to commit to a concept. So can I do a concept? Wait, you can't because we didn't have the budget for it. So trying to figure out a solution, and we actually figured out one. So uh, the banana stand um, was actually made during a power-up day at Avalanche Studios. Um, Power Up Day is a one-day company-wide event at Avalanche that's uh, dedicated to making non-project-related content or project Easter eggs. So if you played any like Just Cause games, you notice that we take pride in our Easter eggs. And you've seen the banana, uh, the banana stand. There's like a balloon gun that you, when you shoot people, like basically their head just becomes like a balloon. If you shoot them more enough, they'll just fly to the sky. There's a cow gun. Um, there's the Bennett Foddy uh, getting over it Easter egg. Um, a lot of very interesting things take on me. <laughs> and uh, we, we totally have a lot of fun with it. So I, I figured, well, uh, you know, why not spend the day in exploration and see if we can rough out some design sketches? So, of course, I got approval because it wasn't on really like development time. It was just a day to have fun. And unfortunately, no banana stands this time. So throughout the day, um, I ended up looking at the keywords that I just kept returning back to the keywords I was given, ancient old, old world, uh, made with parts of a demon. And I started to also experiment with, uh, experiment with pieces of the creature model, uh, which was being designed simultaneously uh, by the character artist Jesse Benelli, and kind of working off of his design and what he had been working on and what he had at that moment in time. And of course, looking at the ornamental aspect and how to add ornaments. And uh, a brief history on like, the origin of the weapon. We wanted it so it felt like maybe like an ancient warrior. After, after like, maybe it's like 500 years ago, when the demons were unearthed or somehow summoned there, uh, oh, and, any, and a warrior was walking like, through the jungle, through the forest, and tried to craft a weapon, these demons were like un undefeatable, and what they did was took parts of, a, of uh, remains of one of the demons that had gotten killed and take part of the demon and attach it to whatever uh, culturally accurate historical weapon that they would use in that time and basically manufacture and hand make this weapon to use and kill the demon. So trying to keep that origin story in, in my head was something that I was trying to think of even at this stage. So the design team felt this was taking us in the right direction and that, that it was very necessary. Um, know your boundaries early. So as I was going through here, I made some silhouette studies from the top because the side view of a crossbow isn't very distinctive. Of, it doesn't really describe the shape as much. So I got some top-down stuff. And then I started doing some if you look towards the middle, I have uh, angled sketches. I started playing with different shapes, and I went really extreme really early because I didn't have the time. Uh, I didn't have the time to really inch it up, inch it, take it to another level, take it to another a level. So it's good to take it to the extreme if you're crammed on dev time, so you can establish your ground and your ceiling and the boundaries you can work within. Uh, for instance. Uh, no Diablo. So on uh, number five, um, uh, when we were originally figuring out like inspiration, uh, one of the one of the pictures that were thrown in there was the the weapon from Diablo. So I just went on. I'm like, okay, let me just draw something close to Diablo just to see what people would say. Um, so we clearly were like, nope, this is too much. Very similar. We want to do something different. We want to do something unique. Um, so got approval. Actually, at the end of the day, went through like eight hours of back and forth, um, but we felt like this was going in the right direction, but you can't really come up with a concept in just one day. So this was sort of a proposal and a pitch to say, 
this is worth it to look into further and actually to take the time. So I got approval to spend more time in exploration and flesh out a concept. So officially was moved on to being the official concept designer for this weapon. So references, uh, no concept. So I was creating it from scratch and at this point, I am continuously looking for and gathering references images and videos. So you can never have too much reference. And if you came over to my last presentation yesterday, I did emphasize that you can never have too many references. Um, I've gathered real world references and, excuse me, and I looked at different, different things such as, uh, since this takes place in South America, I looked at Mayan, Incan weaponry, look at historical forums for our ancient indigenous tribes. I really tried being accurate and culturally accurate because uh, I think this is something that we, have, we can totally improve in when we're really trying to depict different cultures. Um, so one of, my favorite, one of my favorite softwares that I like to use is PureF. It is a image reference organizer program and it's, you can get it online. It's so simple to just drag and drop as many images as you want. And uh, yeah, like I love adding notes to it. These things can go to like 300 images. So just like the cluster bomb launcher, there is no weapon like this. It's, uh, this one's completely fictional, unless somebody finds one like this, that'd be awesome. Um, so yeah, about 100 years ago, as these creatures rose up, a warrior, perhaps Incan or Aztec, using only the materials they had on hand, had found demon parts on the ground, had some animal parts, wood, obsidian, which is like lava rocks, uh, and crafted this weapon by hand. Really looking into the, the different weapons that were being used, and in uh, South American indigenous tribes, they typically used natural resources, no metal, just wood, animal parts, Obsidian. Obsidian was very sturdy, and it was good for like arrows. If you're throwing like like a javelin type type uh, type weapon or something with a blade, it's it's pretty sturdy, and these are super resilient. Looked at uh, Animal Kingdom parts again, working with the character artist to see what his reference was for the demon parts. If we're gonna construct this weapon to be part part animal or part creature, looking at how it could fit in with if we want to make add ornaments to it, it's looking at uh, Incan, Aztec, and Mayan culture and see how they put ornaments on their wardrobe, on their weapons. And they were very ornamental. They just added a bunch of things and it just added a lot of character. There were carvings, beads, paintings. Um, and then for the, for the demon parts, aside from figuring out what the demon was made of, what does that look like when it's been 500 years. So this weapon was, again, supposedly like created maybe 500 years ago, and Rico finds this weapon. It's not gonna look pristine. It's not gonna look like it's just been dirtied up and been blasted by dust. This is 500 year, years old, and it's organic material. And this was also, um, from, my under, from my experience, I don't see that many weapons that are combining sort of like animal parts and, and uh, mechanical engineering, similar to like Biomex. So a lot of the inspiration I was thinking of as well as like H.R. Giger and looking at how they combine different materials. So concepting in ZBrush. So I started concepting in ZBrush, just loose sculptures to define form, the form in 3D space. And the benefit of sculpture is you get 360 degrees equaling to like 360 concepts, if you think about it, versus one angle and one concept if you were to do it in 2D. So it's a very powerful way of concepting things. You could sort of get some good results fairly quickly. ZBrush allows for quick concept conceptualization without being married to an idea because you've spent too much time on it. And I already had parts of the demon model to play with to Frankenstein something together. So after going through the sketches with the, with the designer, I ended up narrowing down the designs and I built upon approved designs. 
I started concepting in ZBrush using different parts of the daemon, kind of like warping them a little bit so they fit more of the, the structure that you would see in other known, like existing crossbows. I made loose sculptures to define them and just tried to figure out different things. So I, I just built up, like paint, I did paint overs in Photoshop just to see how it would look. Um, the only thing here though was we didn't understand if the bone was able to bend after 500 years because in a crossbow design you have the bow that bends slightly as the string gets pulled back to release and basically um, create a projectile of whatever bolt is in the middle. Uh, but at the same time, if it's super rigid, how is it going to spring forward? So we were kind of stuck there, but there was something that we had noticed when we were looking at the mechanics of the demon and how it was actually, how it was actually an enemy. So this next video is going to show the, basically the mechanics of the, of the demon creature. These demons also have the power to possess Black Hand or Army of Chaos soldiers, which then utilize their equipped weapon to attack. Not only that, but if the demon occupies a soldier with a unique ability, it can siphon this from them too. Cool. So after this realization of the type of mechanics that the demon already had in its jaws and its mandibles, we pivoted our design. So our original intent was a fixed bow and made possibly from one large bone of the demon. And we started actually looking at more advanced crossbows that exist, like the mechanical crossbow, the spring action crossbow. And they had, the, each side had a spring and it actually bent intentionally so that way when you pull it forward, like you unlock it, it just shoots out the projectile at an even more advanced rate. And that almost seemed like what the jaws of the, the creature did. It had this sort of spring action strength. So I started working with the animation team and looking at how they were animating the jaws. Let's see. Can I play that? There we go. So, um, so I took the jaws from the creature and isolated it and just applied that stock that I was looking at. And we were taking the demon's greatest weapon and using it against them. And we realized the mechanism already had a built-in crossbow function. And it was potentially, it could potentially have a wind-up behavior rather than use flexibility of the bone to bend back for the, bone, for the bow. The force of the jaw closing could send the projectile at such a rate that it causes damage to the demon. So I synced with the character artist to learn more about the creature. And uh, here's, uh, that was a video of just showing maybe how does it look at different angles. And I remember having that up on my screen and coworkers were like, this is gnarly, what, is, what game is this? Because <laughs> we were all working on different DLCs and it was, it was a very different scenario. We, we don't normally work on these things like this. So we took the, de uh, the demon's greatest weapon and used it against them. So after that, we started looking into how does it look in the braced and the latch position. So on the top, we have a paint over of the strings and potentially having each uh, the the two top mandibles and the two lower mandibles to have uh, basically like an animal uh, tendon or something. Because again, going back to um, this is ancient civilization, we're not making it today. We're making it based on how it would have been made back then. So just here's uh, just another shot of different exploration that we did. We looked at the magazine. So how do you put a magazine in something that was supposed to be sort of fundamental and like rudimentary? Looked at different, uh, different variations of the stock and what it meant to ornamentalize it and make, make it look a little bit more uh, within the world of the ancient civilization. Different, uh, different magazines. How is it, how are the projectiles going to be stored? How are, how's, Depending on this design, 
that would lead to animation having to figure out how to reuse anima uh, animations and how, how are we going to do a reload if he only ever goes here to, let's say, get a grenade or he only, there, let's say there's the grenade reload and then there's the rifle reload. But there's no something, let's say, going up here. So maybe this is not a good idea. Maybe it's good to put it down there. Maybe we don't need a magazine. Maybe how are we going to have multiple bolts? What are the bolts? These are all these questions that this allows us to really think about and try to really solve early on. So player interaction. We were nailing, trying to nail down the proportions for the concept. And because I didn't have any model within the game, this was sort of trying to look at what was in game, what works, and really retrofitting it to work in that same size. So it took something like this, a couple screenshots, let's say, of uh, Rico on the side, what uh, the, let's say, this weapon is stored on the back, how it looks like, and how he's aiming a weapon. And what I did was I took a, the sculpt that I did in ZBrush, took a couple screenshots in that same angle, and brought them into Photoshop so we can actually see what it looked like. And right here, we, we found problems and we found things that were working. So, if, uh, for example, on the left side, if we took into account the, the size currently, we would notice there's some, some sort of imbalance between the stock and the front of the bow. And this was something that was brought up fairly quickly. And if we didn't do this, this may have been overlooked until way later down the line. Uh, looking at the front side view, that, you know, that looks pretty cool. But the grip is very unconventional compared to previous weapons. Again, going to the extreme just to see if it's too extreme, then we dial it back. But at least we know we can go far. And this is how you get something that it's like a really unique end result. You really should start pretty high at the very beginning. Because if you start very high, if you start sort of safe in the beginning, and you try to get higher and higher towards the end, it's only going to get more expensive. So try all your different ideas and risks in the beginning. And then on the right, we have how the player is when they're aiming. And they're sort of in, in close-up mode. You can actually see the side view of the weapon. You don't really get a real good glimpse of it. So with this view, we can actually see, would the player know? if the weapon is latched or braced? Would they know when you bring it back and they're shooting at demons or they're running? Can they tell? Does the silhouette change? And will they remember if, they, if, it's, if, it has, if it's loaded or not? So we have to make sure that there's a distinction between the open and closed. And this type of view helped see that. So for example, after this, I move maybe rotated the teeth a little bit out to give that distinction, because when you have it open and the teeth are kind of pointing down and it's breaking that silhouette, you can tell it's open. And then when it's closed, you don't see it at all. Maybe things like that. Or maybe there's, uh, there's another thing that just adds to it and you can tell. So again, this is, uh, this is similar to before, where you're just trying to put it in the same size and trying to really lay it over on top and see, maybe bring it to, to the same size as the grip. So maybe take the grips, have them keep the same proportion. And then everything else might be bigger or smaller, and you can adjust accordingly. So you're eyeballing and approximating the size of the crossbow compared to the rifle. And it just allows us, even though we've never worked with the crossbow, it gives us something really early on to work with. So the Colored concept, this was the first iteration, basically bringing in the current sculpture into Photoshop and just getting materials and colors explored. At this time, it's not really about fleshing out a final product, but we needed to figure out like what is this going to look like in terms of colors, in terms of materials. And here was a materials list that I put together. So for straps, is Raffia and Sissel, 
obsidian, maybe you're jammed into the stock, which is a very common uh, material that they used. The bowstring would be animal sinew, which is very sturdy, and it wouldn't be rope because rope isn't something that they would ever use. Uh, the stock wood could be different types of woods that were common in those areas, and the bow would be made, made out of bone and cartilage and decayed, decayed flesh of the mandibles. And started really figuring out, like, what, again, what, what does the decayed flesh look like? Is this demon, is the skin of the demon similar to creatures that exist in the real world? Are they alien? Are they maybe something that is just super unfamiliar, but it makes sense? So, like, some of the textures I actually use, like, concrete, decayed concrete textures off buildings to really try to get different things and try to see maybe to get something alien and different. So pushing it even further, defining the anatomy. So uh, in industrial design, it's, it's common to say form follows function, and it typically does, but not in this case. Uh, function follows form because we were creating a function around the form that already exists. And because here we wanted to keep the jaws looking like it came from the same creature, so we wanted to maintain the form and aesthetic of the anatomy, however, evolve the function of it. With that said, because at this time the demon creature itself wasn't finalized, there is a little bit of wiggle room for the artistic liberty in changing how it looks, so long as it improves aesthetics. Uh, so in, in here, for example, it says, since the skeletal structure is going to play a major part and how the weapon prod functions, and selling the mechanics of the weapon, here is one variation of the demon's anatomy. So there's two examples. There's the exoskeleton, which is, has an external skeleton. It's like a hard encasement on the surface of the organism. So example would be uh, crab. And an endoskeleton is where hard structures are within soft tissue of the organism, such as humans and horse and mammals. And because trying to figure out what this demon was made of, Again, it was, this was being designed simultaneously with the demon creature, so they might have had the animations and how this demon was going to attack soldiers, but they didn't really know what was the anatomy. So this is something we really want to deep dive in, because if this is going to be a decayed flesh weapon, how are we going to know what's the underside? Like, if, if you were using, let's say, um, like a decayed, like, let's say, a bat, as a part of a weapon, we know that there is a skeleton within those wings after the flesh had decayed. But with this demon creature, if we don't know what's inside, we don't know how to properly portray it. And especially in next-gen games, they really want you to hone in on the, all those little details. And if you don't do that early on, it's going to be very vague, and we can't really push the, the, the quality of textures that we can. So this is uh, another couple screenshots of defining that anatomy, figuring out the bone joints that are within there, and just having a little fun with just trying different, different things. Brought in the crossbow within, the, within sub uh, ZBrush, and again, always going back to the metrics and scale. Sometimes you end up scaling things and moving so much proportion than you expect you would. So by always having it in the scene, you constantly have something to return to. So I'll compare the generic uh, bow model with the new one, and again, get a sense of proportion. So here are some silhouette studies. Basically the same concept as my first silhouette studies, where when I was sketching, I showed silhouette studies from the top. So I learned the importance of silhouette studies from Neville Page, who is a creature designer, and uh, through his creature design workshop at Noman, basically showed the power of a silhouette. It's super vital, and sometimes we can get really, really obsessed with the details within an object, but not necessarily the shape that it creates. And when you're dealing with trying to get unique shapes, you're trying to figure out how does that object affect the space that it's in. And the silhouette is the main like direct line of really changing the way it's perceived in space. 
and just a quick note here, uh, also when I had this up, I had different, different coworkers and coming over and trying to guess what kind of animals went into this. Some said Venus flytrap, and it actually worked really well for them because uh, for the environment team, they were so excited because they actually looked at a lot of different like fungi and Venus flytraps and mon like carnivorous plants. And I, I wasn't aware of that because I wasn't focused and I wasn't working with that team. So it was sort of a happy accident. Again, tying back into the world of that DLC, I knew I was going in the right direction. And this was my sort of like final uh, concept within ZBrush, just getting what we had all sort of at that time approved on and we really thought that it was going in, in, in a great direction. Having sort of like an exoskeleton structure on it and getting some sort of de decayed flesh on the, the tendon areas where the, the two mandibles would separate. So for the gray box model, after finalizing that, that concept, I ended up going into ZBrush and I retopologized re the sculpture with ZRemesher and that got me pretty good, like about 80% there. And the rest I manually retopologized. It, it's sort of a complex object when it comes to the mandibles. So there were certain places that uh, didn't quite retopologize as cleanly as I wanted to, so right there I would have to do some manual work. Um, but after that, brought it into the game, exported from Maya, and brought it into the game. Uh, here actually it's faked, it's not actually spawnable at this point yet, it's just a static model floating in the scene. And if you can actually tell, he's actually holding a rifle, and I just lined it up as close as possible, because now I don't have to try to eyeball it in Photoshop, I have it within the, within the game. And this still can be just exploration, because we still didn't really, really finalize the design just yet. So um, we went into rigging and animation, because still trying to see if this is still the right direction. We know we were very confident, but you never want to just say, yes, this is, this is done and, and we're done. You want to make sure everybody is unified because we're also working with a publisher. And if, not, if we know not everyone's unified, they're going to sense that as well. So we continued working. Um, the brand new rig was approved by animation. The joints and skeleton, once, it, once it's done, it, it must not change once it's established. And then syncing with animation constantly, I worked with uh, Ludwig Migren, who's an animator, and uh, we really honed in on every single detail and just basically iterating that model for a while. So this next video, there's no audio, but uh, this next video was one of his tests that he did where you're actually seeing the projectile, and it's the first animation test that we did to see if this was actually a plausible concept. Yeah, we got some good action. If you know, like uh, all the different animated terms, overlap, timing, it just actually felt pretty good. So packaging the concept. So due to being needed on another DLC task, and this happens, sometimes you're working on a task, you could be working on it for a couple weeks and you get really close with it and you learn the ins, ins and outs of it, but sometimes, um, you're needed for another task, and this happens in the industry. So I wasn't able to see this through to the end of integrating and final model and final art and functionality because I need to jump onto this next task uh, fairly quickly, like the next day. So the completion of the model was uh, after this concept was, actually after this work was done, uh, it was actually handed over to the character artist, Jesse, who was also designing the creature. He was probably the best person equipped for the job. So I worked packaging up everything, submitting my files into Perforce, which is our version control. And the goal is to be, be able to handle over 
reusable, hand over reusable work to the next stage of production. So all that work, you put it in a nice package, you make sure it's very clear to the next person that's gonna be working on it. That way, nothing gets slipped between the cracks and you don't want all your research, all your hard work to possibly get missed. And like something's very, like I, I really honed in on, this weapon cannot have any metal. I was like, just make sure. So it was in the, do in the docs and everything. Or similar things to, okay, these are all the Photoshop files. This is my pure ref reference file. So as soon as he got it, he was able to work with me and just taking it over. So I like to call this part passing on the baton because it literally feels like that. You know, you're just like running to the finish line. You're getting up to the next speed. Okay, I can't go any further. Here you go. So. Uh, Jesse, I think, did an outstanding job seeing it through to the end. It evolved from the initial design concept. Much of the idea and spirit of the weapon is still there. Areas where the design was not fully realized, it was fully realized in the best aspects. Uh, I mean, look at that emission, the glow on the weapon. This is something that I didn't even think about. We talked about iridescence, but this actually made it so it was super unique. And, uh, and yeah, so that's my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Full Sail. Cool. Any questions? Oh, um, hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, how many pieces do you remember, like, it being, like, at the end of the model? Like, how many separate pieces? So... Um, that's a good question. So I don't know what the final model is because uh, literally when I had handed it over, I ended up jumping on other tasks and that, that one that you had seen before, previously, um, that was in a trailer and that was the next time I even saw the weapon. Um, so I, I didn't even know how it was going. Um, but when I was working on it, I think each, so the mandible was skinned so um, when it's skinned and you have animators working with it, it's typically one mesh. Um, if it's, let's say, something more like, it, it really kind of depends because you can have multiple meshes in one object. In my, like if you double click and you have each, each object is not, the vertices aren't together. So if you put a certain rig in there, it's gonna look like two pieces, but really it's just one mesh. That one was probably one mesh, and then the stock was one. I can't really say how they did it, did it at the end, but that, um, that hinge part and maybe all the different strings, it could, it could go up pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, I would say like the main part where the mandible was was one just one skin mesh. The, the real question is how many bones was in it because there's a lot of different uh, flexibility in there or you say like uh, different movement in there. Hopefully that helps answer your question. Oh. Hi, um, what kind of things do you put when you document your assets? Like, I, I'm, I'm not an artist, so I'm not familiar with how you guys do that. So how do we document? Yeah. Um, like, in, you're talking about, like, in notes? Uh, yeah, like, um, you talked about, like, how you wrote documentation for the handover. Uh, when you guys, oh. like, finish an asset, yes. do you also document it? Yes. Um, so uh, I did a lot more documentation for this one because um, I was the only one that worked on the art for this, and uh, a lot of the decisions that I I'd felt... Uh, working with the designer, working with the animator, um, I really tried keeping it together um, all in one because when I handed over to him, he may not know who was working with me. So typically, I would either slack him, something as simple as talking to him about those situations and messaging him, sending him documentation like Google Notes, um, working in Perfor, so submitting the ZBrush files, submitting Pura files, submitting Photoshop files. Uh, I think that's about it. So basically the files and sending him the li links to where those are is the main thing. 
Thanks. Yeah, I saw his hand first. I'll get you next. Okay. Uh, I, I was wondering how long uh, you worked on this project. Oh, um, I can't recall. It might have been, it might have been about a month or so, because uh, yeah, typically DLCs are very short turnaround times, and I had jumped on, probably going to be working for about two weeks, and then I was like, no, I really want to do the concept design. So uh, I think I ended up working a lot longer than I, they had intended me for. So I think it was about like a month. If anything, because I'm also working on other tasks at the same time, so it might have been two months on and off. Um, for working on this specific scenario, or you mean like DLC? I would say, um, so about average, um, it would be maybe like six months. Be a lot, it would be a, a lot longer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hi, um, what advice would you give to upcoming artists to really hone on their craft and uh, create some of the amazing things that you've done so far? Cool, um, so one thing I would, I always push for is always keep yourself inspired. And that actually goes a long way. Actually not looking at others' artworks as an artist, I noticed um, it really, it sucks out my creativity and my inspiration. I don't realize that until I look at others' work and I realize, oh, wow. Um, I, I hear that's a personal preference because I've heard some people say that they just don't look at anyone's work. And, um, but I've heard that from more like maybe people working in the industry for quite a few years. Um, I would say when you're a student leaving, um, let's say this environment, you should keep yourself immersed in that because the main reason that I think we are inspired is because we have a lot of creativity around us. And then you go out into the real world and there might not be all the same amount of artists that you see. So having everybody around you that's creative or creating that space, so go to ArtStation, go to um, uh, PolyCount, going to Substance Academy and seeing what others have done, and looking at tutorials there, looking at different relevant just breakdowns and work that people are sharing, that that actually goes a long way because you might say, oh, I'm looking at this weapon, let's say an art station, and you're like, I wonder how that is glowing. And you're just make like, maybe one day you'll make something like, let's say a simple butterfly model and you want to put a missive on it. Now you know how to make something glow and then you have that butterfly, I want to animate it. And you just kind of start digging yourself into this unknown territory and next thing you know, you're like making an animation of a garden with beautiful flowers <laughs> and, and butterflies. And, and actually that is kind of the key to really honing your craft. It's all these different things you'll learn. And then you'll also figure out what you like best and most. And that can also help you in, in a way too because you'll, you'll want to do it even more. And it's less of a chore, it's more of, I need to do this because this makes me feel good. Thanks. Uh, my name is Arilas. Um, in the future, I want to focus more on character design. And I was wondering if, uh, if you wanted to do that also, or if you knew which field you wanted to focus on in modeling. Okay. And then also, I was wondering, as far as the steps from concept to the end point, how much of it we should know? Sorry, your second question, how much? How much should the 3D modelers know as far as like concept design, modeling, rigging, and then further? Okay, cool. So um, I'll answer the uh, second one first. Um, with the, with, when it comes to being a character artist or a 3D modeler, typically you're going to have a concept to work with and you're not going to be responsible or expected to make a concept because that, there's a lot of things that go in. Uh, that's why like uh, yesterday we didn't talk about really concept design because I had the concept and it's about staying loyal to the concept but iterating where you need to. And in this one, it's the design and there's a lot that goes into that. So um, when it comes to like being a 3D modeler, you wouldn't necessarily need to have to do a concept but um, just being a 3D modeler, you do have an eye for 
for design, like an, you have an eye for detail and you have an eye for aesthetics. So sometimes if you do need to, at, at certain points, have to rely on your own, let's say um, there isn't a concept, you can pretty much realize it um, through 3D or with the skills that you've acquired in the past. And then and rigging and animation, in, at Avalanche, we're a fairly small team. So I think this is depending on the studio size that you work at. If you're working at a company that's, let's say, 1,000 to 2,000 people, there might be more specialized areas. So if you're a 3D modeler, you might just be 3D modeling, let's say, this specific asset for X number of years of development. You might just be working on grass. You might be just rigging pouches on characters' waist or something. Um, with our studio, however, uh, we are only like, usually like top, it's like, uh, like a little around like 100, 150 for working on a, a giant open world action game. So sometimes we put on different hats. So I, because through that, I've learned for years, uh, throughout the years, how to rig, how to animate, uh, how to set up like the weapons. And then we have people there that also do that, but they're also sometimes spread thin as well. So it, it definitely comes in handy when you work at smaller studios. Um, and then for the first question, you asked uh, if I w always want to do like character design. So um, f funny enough, I actually majored, uh, I, I came here for computer animation, and I majored in character modeling. And my, I have my character modeling demo reel. And I did want to break into being a character modeler, even though it is a very small, it is a very sm kind of small demand, but a high competition. Like I know a lot of people want to do character modeling. The same as like um, you can always find in a in a jam session nine people that want to play guitar and maybe like one person that wants to play basses or drums or or sing. So with that said, I pursued it because this was the only place that would give me the resources and time to develop that if I could potentially break in. Um, I ended up getting a job at Avalanche as an environment artist because of a internship that I took as a character modeler working on a 3D, a realistic 3D model of a skeleton, a human skeleton. And I guess they saw that uh, there was a lot of things that I applied that they think that I could have applied to other concepts, so environments and everything. And that was just a really a great opportunity. It was a luck, which for me, luck means opportunity and timing or preparedness and timing. And um, I got into environments, then I naturally got into vehicles and weapons. Uh, that being said, I still do creature, I actually do creature artwork on the side. I do it all the time. I have this thing called uh, 30 Days, 30 Creatures, which I do every October, and I just, every day, I'll just make a, a new creature design. Because I, you can have multiple passions. It's totally okay. And actually, whatever makes you feel like you're, you're, you're not sinking, you don't wanna, you wanna feel creative and you wanna feel empowered. So my way is working in creature design anyway. And I'm able to do both, and it's, and it's okay. Thanks. You talked a little bit about your relationship between the designer and in you as the uh, character artist, or that's the weapon art artist. Um, can you maybe go into more detail of what exactly the designer like gave you, or maybe like how the relationship short, should sort of be? Like, the, um, what type of tips would the designer kind of give you to be able to do your job better? Right. Okay. So uh, yeah, the designer was uh, Jacob Antonucci, who was uh, working on the DLC Los Demonios, and he was pretty much the overall overseer of how the the whole DLC was going to behave and how the gameplay mechanics were going to work and and sort of like the art director in a sense and the game the basically the game director for that DLC and I would go to him for almost anything cuz for me um, I've never worked as a concept artist, so I didn't know what a concept artist does and like how, I, I know what I'd, I'd normally do, um, but just to be safe, I was constantly going to him and uh, he was very, very supportive in, in all these different suggestions that I had. Um, what, I, what I understand is that he would be at every, every team's pod 
like animation, level design, environment, art. And constantly, because he would know all of what's going on, so I would be like, does this tie in to environments? Would this tie in to the way like animations are working? All these different nuances. So um, yeah, thanks. So uh, when you spoke about retopologizing uh, your crossbow, could you go into a little more detail about how you did the inorganic and the organic, uh, the complications you might have had going from uh, zero mesher to the manual topology? Yes. Uh, so that's, that's really good that you asked that, um, because it was not as straightforward as I thought it was going to be, because as being a as being a 3D modeler, I know that sometimes we'll we'll topologize things in a way that will work for animation. And because I wasn't sure how it was going to animate, I wasn't sure if it was going to be like a, a sort of crab-like shell. The tendons between the crab is soft tissue, so it stretches. But when it decays, that's gone. But Animation wanted it because it looked aesthetically pleasing. So if I had each one separate, I wouldn't, and it was rigid, I don't have to worry about edge flow. So then I could just deal with whatever's there. But because I wasn't sure if we wanted to flex and still, this is the artistic liberty, this is about games, right? Like, I, as I mentioned, cartilage doesn't flesh, uh, flex as, 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 uh, as it would in a fresh state, but then I was hearing from animation, no, it would be easier to do, but if, if we have to account for flexibility, the edge flow needs to be animation friendly. So despite that, I, I retopologize it so there was no like star junctions, even though it was potentially gonna be a rigid object. So I separated each plate, as you saw in those, uh, those divided lines like a crab, there were different meshes, but if you had to combine them and skin them and then they were going to flex, they were still going to be able to hold up for animation without all those pinching and what you would get like if you have bad topology. Uh, so it was definitely a back and forth, and I had some didn't understand how why it was taking me so long to retopologize. I said, you'll find out later on if this was done incorrectly, and then, some, then we're going to have to reskin it. Somebody's going to have to remodel it. Who knows if, um, if it was actually retopologized later because the design was changed. From, from the looks of it, I can assume so many things. But yeah, like it's, it can get tricky in that, in that scenario because animation doesn't have a concept to work with. So you're just like designing, and they're trying to feel it out for you as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of Hall of Fame. <laughs>